Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes? Good. Um, so, um, I've been introduced. I, I work with a program called uh, the PASET Regional Scholarship and Innovation Fund, uh, based at ISIPE in uh, Nairobi in Kenya. And uh, as, as mentioned, my topic is on building skills uh, for delivering, delivering Africa's Agenda 2063, the role of science and policy. Um, I focus this on uh, the Agenda 2063 uh, because it's focused on Africa. Um, and it doesn't mean any less that Africa is not focused on the SDGs. Uh, Africa, through the African Union, uh, has a, a common position on the SDGs, uh, which is actually a document that's available on the African Common Position on the Sustainable Development Goals, which is available online on the AU uh, website. Uh, but also trying to uh, highlight uh, the importance of not only science, but also policy for science in terms of delivering on Africa's uh, Agenda 2063. So I wanted to start uh, by reminding ourselves what uh, Africans have said they want. Uh, when uh, the last uh, AU chair, uh, Dr. Dlamini Nzuma, uh, who now has gone back to South Africa as a minister for the presidency, she uh, took us through a process of trying to um, come up with a common vision across the continent on what Africa wants to achieve by 2063. And the year 2063 was selected because it is 100 years uh, since the formation of the Organization for African Unity, the OAU, which later transitioned into the African uh, Union. And as part of this agenda, a number of different policies uh, have been put in place uh, to deliver, to ensure the delivery of this agenda uh, within uh, mainly largely two, three departments within the African Union are critical in this. One is the Department of Science and Technology, uh, which has the, um, the STISA, the Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy for Africa which is all about putting science at the center of, uh, of, of the development agenda. Uh, that's the STISA. Within the AG side, then we have, of course, the CADAP, which is now the Malabu Declaration. And then also through, uh, on the research side, uh, the, um, what is it called? The SAA, the Science Agenda for Agriculture in, in Africa. So we are looking for, uh, to become an integrated, as well as a prosperous and peaceful continent which is driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. So we want to be competitive. I think that's what Africa, the message from, from the continent, but also to harness the full potential of women as well as youth and to ensure that those are realized with freedom from fear, disease, and from lack or want. So that uh, very uh, broadly encapsulates what, uh, what, what the, the Agenda 263 has. Of course, within it, there's a very detailed uh, 10, 10 points and then also uh, an, implementation, an implementation plan for how it will be uh, delivered. But at the same time, uh, we need to remember, I think we've talked a lot about uh, poverty over the last few, uh, few days. And uh, you can see here in terms of some of the, the countries that uh, we see are on track for meeting the sustainable development goals. And uh, saddeningly, on the continent, a lot of countries are not on track, or even worse, many are actually poverty is rising rather than moving towards meeting the target for the SDGs. Uh, we know that globally the number of extreme poor fell from 1.9 billion to 736 million, and this is globally, but in Africa the number of extreme poor was actually going in the other direction. And a number of the challenges were seen in more the um, uh, the places where there's lots of dense uh, populations. Uh, and Nigeria is one example, but there are a number of others. I think the map in the last presentation also showed you some of those other countries like Tanzania, Uganda, and so on and so forth, where we still have a lot of challenges because of uh, fast-growing uh, populations. I also wanted to uh, start by contextualizing where we are, that uh, Africa has been one of the fastest-growing continents uh, in the world globally, but coming from a very low base. Uh, if you see uh, in terms of GDP growth, uh, this graph compares 
our performance between um, uh, 2015 to 2017, so very recently, and we compared that with between 1995 and 2008. And uh, you can see here then, if you see those that have been over the last, uh, how do you say, two decades almost, performing relatively well, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and, and, and Rwanda, and those that have improved, meaning in the last period they performed not so well, in the more recent period they performed much, much, much better with Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Kenya, and Mali. And these are largely many of the countries that perform quite well in terms of science, uh, their science capacity as well as the science output uh, on the African continent. And then you go to see some of these who, uh, uh, in terms of, they haven't grown before, and even now they're still having challenges in terms of growth. And we feel like they're now being left behind. And some of them you might understand, Zimbabwe, Burundi, uh, Congo, uh, because of some of the challenges that the countries are having uh, within uh, themselves. Uh, and then some of the others which are not so uh, clear, like South Africa, which has been growing quite slowly, uh, both before and, and, uh, and, and now. So this gives you some idea of what's happening. Growth has been fast. And some of the more, the larger markets uh, globally are actually in Africa because of this uh, very fast growing uh, populations. I think the other last thing in terms of setting the context is to remember that the world is changing and the world continues to change. So it's not enough to hit the old targets, but we need to be looking even beyond where we are uh, today. And I think uh, one might argue that we've missed out on a number of the, uh, you know, the, the different uh, stages uh, in terms of uh, 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 the electricity mass production division of labor. Many countries are now just thinking about industrialization and how to do that. You heard the presentation from Ghana where they're talking about one district, one industry. So this is uh, some of what's happening now on the continent, but also having to deal with the issues of uh, the use of uh, computers and enhancing efficiency. And then now, of course, even more because of uh, this whole uh, generation now of Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. And so things are moving very fast. And I think Africa needs to think not just about what we've lost so far, but we have to also think into the future to prepare for what's coming. And it has to be done from now. So the scale of the challenge is, is very large. Uh, we're talking about uh, the need to have not just the high-level scientists, the PhD qualified staff, but also we're looking at technicians, uh, technologists, uh, and all these to allow us to be able to adapt, adopt, so we can argue that we can pick some technologies that have already been developed in different parts of the world, bring them to Africa, quickly ad adopt them, adapt them, and move much faster, but also create things that are useful for us, and that all needs capacity on the continent to do so. So in terms of policy, we're thinking about uh, how do we enhance excellence on the continent, uh, starting in, in terms of graduate excellence, to be able to train uh, the scientists and the skills that will be able to use science to support the development ambitions of, of the continent. And so here, uh, we have some of the, the common factors that we need to consider. One is, uh, of, we're saying we're looking for excellence, and to have that, we will need uh, much stronger research output. All of us know that, again, Africa is one of the lowest on the globe. Some figures say 2.1%, 2.5%, 3.1%, but I haven't seen anything over 3.1% in terms of uh, proportion of research output from Africa. But even then, that research output also is often built on partnerships. It's where African universities or scientists are publishing with SLU and many other partners across uh, the globe. So again, it still remains large. Uh, and there's questions about then, who is a driver uh, for, for, the, for the type of knowledge that's coming out? Is it really targeted to the needs of, of the continent? And then, of course, we need uh, the graduates who will become the scientists uh, for, for the future. And in able to do this, we need to have uh, students, teaching staff, uh, researchers in place. We also need to have funding, uh, resources to drive everything that, uh, that we'd like to do. And then you need, of course, uh, the policy environment that allows you uh, to function, to think strategically beyond, beyond today, and allows the systems to, to, uh, to be put in place uh, to allow uh, the other changes that we'd like to see. So for all these, we need a concentration of talent, we need favorable governance, and we also need uh, the, the, uh, the resources. So now looking at where we are at present, if you compare uh, African countries in terms of research capacity, uh, and this graph uh, shows uh, the researchers per million inhabitants in 35 uh, countries, 
And these countries here are the, the so-called stronger ones uh, on the continent with uh, 200 to 1,500 researchers for every million uh, inhabitants. And then here you have those that have between 60 and 200 and here less than, uh, less than 60. You'll see some of these like uh, Seychelles, of course, is a very small, very, very small population. So maybe one can understand also why uh, this, this is happening. But generally, when you compare even the, the, the so-called stronger African research systems with uh, some of the other comparators like Korea, for example, which in 2016 had 9,072 researchers per million, or even those that are closer to us like Malaysia and Vietnam still are quite far above some of the African uh, countries. So we're really very, very far behind in terms of having the capacity internally to support this growth of science and also to have the knowledge to drive uh, the economic processes. When also you look at uh, graduates in STEM, uh, in terms of uh, within tertiary uh, education, you see again that the numbers are quite low, 21%, uh, 18%, some of this is those enrolled and then uh, graduates. So generally again, quite low when you compare with Malaysia and, and Vietnam. And I think if you look at some of the other countries like the US and so on, then the, the figures also are much, much higher when you compare with, uh, with, with, with some of these. So I think the message here is that, again, not only are the numbers now very, very low, but also the capacity to, to train, to catch up is also low. Uh, if you go to the training centers, you can't have that many PhD graduates because you don't have the system to run them, uh, run them through. You don't have the staff capacity to train, and that becomes a, a major, major challenge. I think the other uh, issue to note here is when you look at agriculture within this number, in many cases, it's only 3% of uh, graduate enrollment is within agriculture, which on the other hand represents a contribution of sometimes 60, 50, 60%, or even 70% in terms of contribution to GDP of many of the African uh, countries. Uh, and then maybe the other issue to note here in terms of graduate education, we often use the term that uh, um, the, grad the undergraduate education is holding postgraduate education hostage because the number of students coming into uh, undergraduate education are so many that many staff are spending their time uh, teaching undergraduates and don't have time to do research. So that also becomes another challenge that, that is highlighted in the system. So in terms of uh, coming back to the, the policy issues, uh, I think the World Bank presents uh, an interesting uh, study. Uh, one, because uh, the program which uh, I now lead and which I'll talk about a little bit more is a World Bank uh, uh, program uh, called PASET, under PASET, the Partnership for Applied Skills uh, in, in Science, Engineering, and Technology. But secondly, also because, um, interestingly, the World Bank in 1986 had a, a study uh, by a gentleman called Parasopoulos with a team. And in that study, uh, one of the findings of the study was that it was uh, wiser for Africa to invest in primary education rather than secondary or higher education. And for over the next two decades, this was a fundamental uh, influencer of funding for higher education on the African continent. And for many, actually two decades after that, we call that the decade of neglect because we could not get funding to higher education because of what came out of, of well, mainly this, uh, this, this World Bank uh, study. Later on in 2015, there was another uh, publication that was talking about schooling uh, and, and the, uh, the effects of schooling, the benefits of schooling, and that also again brought back a lot of the funding to higher education, and there have been other, uh, other papers also since, since then. So the bank has a, a large uh, portfolio of country-level uh, projects within higher education, represented by over three billion in terms of investments, uh, but also uh, in terms of at the regional level, it has two main, uh, two main programs. One is the African Centers, African Higher Education Centers of Excellence uh, projects, uh, which are largely financed through bank credits, uh, through IDA uh, loans. This provides uh, largely uh, very low interest uh, credit uh, or loans to African countries, and it allows those countries that can't afford to borrow from anywhere else to invest in their higher education uh, sectors. And then the second one is the one that I'll spend uh, slightly more time on, is the PASET Regional Scholarship and, uh, and, and Innovation Fund. So in terms of the, uh, the ACE, uh, the African Centers of Excellence, one project was in West Africa with 22 centers. Each of them had approximately 
uh, six to eight million that they're investing to strengthen their higher education systems. And then the ACE2 in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa, they reduced the amount to about six million because there's absorption capacity challenges. And then now is uh, currently being developed now is the ACE uh, impact, which now has about 44 centers that are now being actually, the projects are now being financed uh, through, through the bank. And you can see the breadth of all the different uh, centers across uh, Africa in three main areas, uh, agriculture and in, in, uh, in oil and gas, as well as, sorry, agriculture and STEM, and, uh, and there's one more broad, broad area. But you can see all the, the different centers across all the different African countries, and I won't uh, delve into the, the, the detail uh, there. So the uh, Regional Scholarship and Innovation Fund was uh, launched in uh, 2015, and this uh, program was launched by the President of Senegal, where three African countries, Rwanda, uh, Senegal, and, uh, Ken and Ethiopia at that time, and later Kenya and Ivory Coast joined the initiative. Each of them recognized the need to build science capacity. And all of them agreed to contribute a, a minimum of two million US dollars to initiate this uh, building of capacity for science in, in, in Africa. So the objectives are to uh, train these highly skilled scientists, professionals, and innovators, nurture talented Africans, and give them uh, opportunity to, to study uh, beyond uh, the lower degrees, address the imbalances of, of, of women, and then build the African university capacity to train uh, for, the, for, for the future. The, uh, the design of the program is that it would have a general fund, which is supposed to grow to 50 million by 2024, uh, and it's now at about 36 million and, uh, and, and, and growing. And then we're currently setting up a permanent fund, and the permanent fund is supposed to continue uh, running the cost of operations for the uh, scholarship and innovation fund beyond uh, the current funding that we have at the moment. And we have three windows, one that focuses on scholarships and building university capacity, a second on uh, research grants, and a third on, on innovation uh, grants, so that the scholars who are trained here, uh, as well as the scientists here, would have opportunity to do more research that's focused on being more impactful and more in the applied, more downstream focus, and then also uh, focusing on applying the knowledge that universities uh, generate. Uh, this is how the, uh, the system uh, functions. Uh, so ICPE was in 2018 uh, competitively selected to manage or to host the Regional Scholarship and Innovation Fund on behalf of the uh, African governments. Uh, we have at the core initially a, a World Bank uh, project, uh, but also from each of the countries, now the five countries have all contributed uh, funds that come directly to ICPE. So presently we have uh, five countries, three have paid up their contributions. We're expecting two more uh, to pay and then we're expecting eight more countries to join in the next, uh, in the next year. Uh, and then we have a Passat Secretariat, where the, uh, the, the, first of all, the Governing Council is where the ministers of all the countries sit and they meet at least once a year, often most likely twice a year. And then the Executive Board is normally made up of advisors to the ministers, and they meet once a month uh, to, uh, to approve and to oversee the operations of the, of the scholarship fund. And then we also have a, 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 a CAG uh, that it provides advice. The governments have selected five priority areas. Again, I won't mention them because uh, you can see them there, I hope. But food security and agribusiness is one of them, and ICT as well as climate change are three uh, important uh, areas. So we have selected uh, 11 host universities where the students will go. We also give competitively scholarships to the students with the money that the governments uh, provide. And then we also look for international partners to, uh, institutions to host the students for some part of their, of their research uh, program. These are the 11 universities. Again, I won't spend uh, much time on these uh, because my time is, is, is uh, going to soon be, uh, come to an end. And uh, in terms of the model, uh, we have chosen a sandwich model, but normally reversed to what we're normally used to because normally the uh, students come here and then go to Africa and then come back uh, to another uh, uh, location. But now they go to the African universities that you just saw and then uh, go to an international partner institution where they spend six months up to two years. It may be just six months, or it might be one year, it might be up to maximum of two years, and then go back to their home university uh, to finish their thesis and to, uh, and to graduate. And then we also work with the host university to look at capacity building issues, international accreditation, uh, building curriculum to support the, the, the training, uh, short courses, and so on and, and so forth. In terms of the uh, contribution so far, 
Uh, the permanent fund is not yet set up, but we hope that uh, we will grow that to 15 million by 2024. At present, this is what we have. Uh, we have Korea has made a contribution of, uh, actually it's 10 million, but 9 million directly to ISIPE, and the other million is uh, being managed by the bank for coordination purposes. Uh, Kenya has contributed 2 million, Rwanda 2 million, Cote d'Ivoire 1 million. And so this is, uh, and then other partners also have made other contributions, including, uh, for example, Morocco, the University of Mohammed VI uh, Polytechnic has also made a contribution in terms of taking students and, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to go back to the, uh, some of the, the policy elements of, uh, of the discussion, and I have just two slides uh, left. One is to recognize that uh, in terms of the policy analysis, we're also looking across uh, the um, ex-ante policy analysis, monitoring, ex-post, and then feedback to ensure that it feeds back into how funding and, and uh, the plans are, are initiated. But we also have to remember where does, where does policy analysis come from? And this is where we intertwine the problem between the need for having strong science systems to support uh, policy making and policy analysis. It's really universities, both the local ones and international that support uh, policy analysis, but also you have others, the private sector, which again in Africa, there's uh, many discussions about how strong or how weak it is in, in, in Africa. Other financial institutions, policy research organizations, economic communities, policy units, and and think tanks. For all these, you need a strong a human capacity uh, that would uh, staff and support and manage these uh, institutions. At the same time, we have different constraints on the supply as well as on the demand side. On the supply side, the issue of uh, agricultural information and statistics uh, remains a challenge. Uh, the arrangements for policy research are still often not as mature as, as, as they should be. Funding is a challenge. Uh, again, the, the people themselves and then the collaboration. I think all those uh, speak to each other and are often a major challenge. On the other side of the use of the policy, again, there are a number of, uh, uh, of challenges. I'll just pick out uh, some, the dialogue within government, the issue of silos and so on within different government departments. This also, in many cases, is a major, major challenge. If you go to some countries like uh, Cameroon, for example, the education sector alone may have up to five ministries a ministry of uh, you know, TVET, a ministry of uh, low edu primary education, ministry of secondary education, ministry of higher education, ministry. So it becomes very challenging to, to coordinate across the different policy um, entities. So this is uh, my last slide and uh, my uh, take home uh, messages. One is this uh, strong need to escalate, to really ramp up uh, the um, building of science as well as teaching capacity in Africa, and I think without doubt, even the capacity to collaborate with other partners across the globe is going to be challenged if we don't have people. I didn't also show uh, one slide that showed, again, the retirements, uh, because Africa, again, was lucky that in the 80s and 90s, we had many scientists trained, for example, in the US, uh, long-term training, and many went to Russia, many went to different parts of, of the world. Uh, this stopped at a certain point, and many of these are now retiring, so this also creates another another challenge for us. Secondly, the, the scale of the challenge needs uh, coordinated engagement and governments need to be involved. And I think this is why the bank's uh, input is, is, is important here because of the scale of the funding that it can leverage. That now you can get uh, projects of you know, seven, eight million going to one institution uh, to build that capacity. And there are many other projects. There's another one that was in the pipeline uh, called the Strengthening Higher Agricultural Education in Africa, which is supposed to provide up to 30 million for one university to try to create a full revamping of, 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 the, of the system, but focus on the ag parts of the university to provide uh, um, reform. The third is that I think there's a clear recognition by African governments of the need uh, to strengthen science and the science agenda for development. I think that is now very clear both in terms of uh, the STISA that was approved by African governments and the heads of state, but many other uh, mechanisms as well as PASET that demonstrate that this is now uh, the case. Uh, there is need not just for good policy, but strong policy implementation. Again, there are some countries where people say they have good policies, but uh, the challenge now becomes actually implementing those, uh, those, those policies. Uh, but there are other countries, of course, that are doing well in terms of uh, implementation. Uh, the second to last year is that we need to enhance the linkages between policy and, and funding. And we were discussing this uh, a few days uh, ago, that many of the universities uh, 
in terms of the government public universities are using input uh, funding uh, formulas to fund their universities. So if you have a university like Makere University, they, they know that every department may have one professor and so many senior lecturers, so many associate professors, so many lecturers, and those are, are given amounts and that's what goes into, into the budget. So if you perform very well and you, need, you want to be uh, promoted, you have nowhere to go because there's no second uh, professor position in your department. And so that creates a lot of, uh, unlike for example in South Africa where it's more formula based, uh, they, they, they work it based on uh, competitive grants in terms of publications and so there are different mechanisms to provide funding to stimulate uh, research uh, on, on the continent. And then the last, this, this need for increased uh, science-based policy making capacity. I think if we can't link what we've learned uh, to the future for the, for the continent, I think we'll continue to have uh, challenges. And you can see here, this policy making capacity will need uh, information, will need staff, uh, will need institutional arrangements, uh, collaboration, not only with the private sector, but across a number of entities, uh, and also, importantly, also the funding. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening for me, to me. And uh, I'm pleased to be here. I thank Agri for Say 2030 for inviting me, as well as uh, Agri4D. And thank you for allowing me to speak uh, with you this afternoon. Thanks.